Welcome to Change Notice, a weekly video podcast for the Build Better community. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, here's the format. We do 20 to 30 minutes of interviews with our guests, which we recorded for future posting, followed by 20 to 30 minutes of off the record discussion that you can only hear if you join us live. Before we dive in, Pete, could you introduce yourself and Blue Clover? Happy to. Thanks, Anna. Yes, I'm Pete Staples, and I started a company called Blue Clover Devices. We operate in Shenzhen. That's where our manufacturing and hardware design take place. And then here in San Francisco is a sales and software development office. Uh, we make electronics for a variety of companies. We make commercial stuff for Tesla and Vertigris. Uh, we do boards for certain chip com companies such as Matrix Industries and Sci-5. Um, and sometimes we do consumer goods as well, like this key organizer for KeySmart. Um, so quite a variety of things and happy to be here and share the perspective of the CM, which is not always rep represented as well um, in this community or in this, uh, uh, in this area. Yeah, we're really great to have, it's really great to have you. Um, so maybe as a starting point, what drove you to start Blue Clover? Like why, why start a CM? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the, the, the original plan. So uh, I came from Boeing and was working on very long time horizon projects and felt like I wanted to do the opposite extreme of consumer electronics, a really fast paced um, launch a product within a year kind of uh, dynamic. And I didn't intend to do manufacturing myself. I just wanted to do design work, um, but it felt like the center of gravity was really in Shenzhen. And so I was spending more and more time there and um, design leads to manufacturing and uh, pro one project led to another. And ultimately we just started to open our own factory and produce things in house to, uh, take better care of our clients. So that was 10 or 12 years ago now that we've uh, been been on the CM side of things. And what um, do you see as unique about Blue Clover? I have ideas, but I'd love to hear <laughs> from you about what's unique. So many things actually. Uh, <laughs> I had a conversation today where somebody said, well, who's your competitor? And I couldn't really put my finger on it. There's We've evolved very organically, and I guess that was the the reason for the name of the company was to keep things pretty vague and flexible, and that's served us well. So we were originally a design house, um, did have trouble differentiating, but doing design and manufacturing was kind of unique when we started doing that. And uh, then we became more focused on IoT products. That was a way of differentiating from a lot of other CMs that we seem to run up against. And uh, now I would say it's really our tools that make us truly unique. So we have our own products and services that we um, sell on our site. Got it. Awesome. I'm sure folks are really curious to hear because we've been spending a lot of time talking on the uh, on the brand side of like how COVID and the chip shortages have, have kind of affected them, but how has it affected Blue Clover um, and your customers, what you can share like in general about the impacts of the last you know 18 months or so um, on your business and your customer's business? Uh, it's, it's definitely disrupting plans. Uh, that's, it's not a, it's not a myth or anything. Um, we just placed an order with Nordic uh, for NRF 52 A32s and they said 52 weeks and we have not heard anything different. So uh, it's, it, we're trying to see the silver lining and, and uh, treat this as an opportunity to make better products since we can't really make anything right now. Anyway, let's just take the time that we never seem to have to uh, improve the design and do a more thorough job than we often get to. Um, it, but it is unprecedented. I mean, there have been shortages in the past, but we haven't seen anything that was this long in our, in our history. And then of course the travel has also been a unique situation too. So normally I'm back and forth a lot between the offices, um, generally once a quarter, but I haven't been there since since this all started. 
I, me neither. We have a we have a team in Shenzhen as well, and uh, there are many I have yet to meet. Um, haven't been able to be there in quite a long time. Um, how have your customers' needs changed during this time? Well, a lot of people are uh, shifting production. I guess this isn't necessarily COVID or chip shortage. It's uh, more geopolitical dynamics. So we have had a lot of com companies urge us to produce in places other than Shenzhen and or have have other options. Um, we know a lot of people are shifting to other uh, Asian locations for production. Um, we haven't really had a project that made that transition, um, but we, we have seen growing interest in our tools because people do need to move things. So having a standard set of equipment that can be ported to different manufacturing locations, uh, something I'm sure you can identify with that instrumental. Um, it it it's sort of like we built these tools for this kind of scenario, and I, I guess we are seeing some of that play out. And then you also kind of mentioned that you haven't been able to travel, so I'm assuming that you've been adapting as an organization as well. Um, what are kind of some of the adaptations that you've made? Well, we've we've always had. Uh, um, set meetings, so weekly meetings that are across offices and it used and it's been on Zoom anyway. So I guess having a multi-location team that has to function together is just usually I'm on different sides of the camera in alternating months and things like that. And now I'm just always in on the same side. So a lot of the uh, things that may make us a little bit unique on uh, just le leveraging a lot of cloud-based tools have kind of allowed us to continue a lot more as normal than, than uh, I might have expected. It, it's been a lot less disruptive than, than it could have been. Got it. So kind of getting into the meat and potatoes, contract manufacturing is a pretty tough business. Um, at least from the outside, it looks tough. Margins might be low. Sometimes uh, how profitable something turns out to be is really related to how efficiently you can execute as an organization. And so as a result, there's often only money for investments with strong ROI. At least that's kind of what we've heard. And so I'm sure our community would be really interested in learning a bit more about that. As a leader, how have you gone about putting together a technology strategy for Blue Clover? Like that's what we're going to talk about today is technology in, in the factory. So how have you even started from like a strategy perspective, um, given kind of the, the pieces of the constraints of the type of business you run? Well, I wish I could say there was this master master plan uh, <laughs> around our- You know, our honesty is, is great too. <laughs> That'll be very approachable for people. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you wanna, you, you don't wanna get lessons from Steph Curry on how to shoot three pointers. He's just going to say, well, I just throw it up there and it goes swish. And then I shimmy my shoulders a little bit. Like you want to talk to someone approachable and uh, I'm not Steph Curry on, on the technology side, but uh, we have adopted a lot of things over the years and seen things work and see things that didn't pan out. And uh, I, I think manufacturing the efficiency comes from repetition and that also makes it very hard to change uh, you know there's just a reason why the cms cling to email and excel spreadsheets because it's it's a huge workforce that's trained around those that 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 muscle memory and uh it's hard to break that and um i guess one one thing we we really made a conscious effort of is just being sure that there was a cloud portal or service or something that we could always check like key transactions. So quotes, orders, shipments, invoices, all these things that, you know, if you don't watch it, uh, they can just lurk in one machine and one email thread and then you're, you're really vulnerable. And so we just consciously attack those weaknesses and uh, try to address them with services that we didn't feel like 
making and there are a lot of offerings out there. So we just cho chose the ones that seem to work for us. So you mentioned kind of the ubiquity of, uh, of Excel and Word as, you know, the tools of the trade. Um, I, you know, we, we spoke before and I know that uh, Blue Clover has kind of has adopted some technologies that maybe link into those or maybe replace bits of that. Can you share a couple of the technologies that you've implemented recently? Um, and like ideally including some of the nuts and bolts, like how did you justify trying them? Maybe they were cheap enough to justify, so it didn't matter, but I'm sure there was still some like organizational overhead to try a different process. And then how did you justify keeping them? Which I think is just as interesting. Yeah, the, the one that every CM does seem to kind of accept and, and, and take on is ERP. So most CMs are like, well, I don't really want to track my inventory in Excel. Like I, I get that <laughs> and they do that and it can be built off from that. And then sometimes that becomes its own weakness because it's a very inflexible system if they go down the SAP route or something where it's potentially millions of dollars, you're, you're really locked into it. And um, it's very hard to try anything new after that. It's all got to feed that giant mach machine. Um, we, did, we did take on an ERP system and we actually moved it not that long ago. So it can be done, but it's, um, it's not trivial. So we were using a system called Canandy, which is built on top of Salesforce. And then Canandy was bought by another company. And then we, we, we kind of felt abandoned a little bit. So we switched to Odoo, which uh, began as OpenERP. It's been around a long time and it's, it's a fairly low cost ERP system. And normally you hire a consultant to help you build it. Uh, that's what we did. And so we, we made that move a few years ago. And then we um, recently shifted from, so PLM is kind of what product lifecycle management is what feeds into an ERP system. And that's one that a lot of CMs hold back on. Um, I think to their detriment, it's, it's, it is hard to justify, but I, I just wouldn't be able to sleep at night without knowing there was a system doing version control automatically on the design of the product. And uh, um, Duro Labs is another uh, option there that we've experimented with, but um, Odoo does have a PLM module and that was a lot cheaper route for us. So um, we moved from Arena, which is used to be the less expensive, least expensive option. We moved that uh, last year to Odoo and uh, um, I really recommend somebody, either the client or the CM, somebody's really got to have a PLM system. And it is hard to justify, but. Um, yeah, what's the ROI on a PLM or an ERP? Probably lawsuits, <laughs> recalls. <laughs> it, it's. It's kind it's of the same when like, people think about like ROI on like CAD. Like, is there ROI on CAD? It's just kind of like a utility. You kind of need it to do the job. Yeah, we never did a, you know, that's one where just owning the company allows you to just decide to do it. And we've never turned back. Um, and now we're, we're, it's so woven into our culture now that we don't have to justify it to ourselves anymore. So if you're on the fence, I guess maybe just chat with me later. <laughs> I can give you anecdotes, but I can't give you a calculation. It's at the day of your design, it is cheaper and easier to do it in Excel, but over over the long term, if you really plan for this product to have a life and have new generation models and things like that, you would definitely make yourself for having PLM and, and uh, it, it resolves a lot of ambiguity between the, the client and the CM for at least one of those companies to have it. And you also mentioned uh, that you've adopted Slack, I think. Yeah, um, we we embraced it. I would say we we were we were kind of trying it out. It seemed like all of our clients were using it, and um, it's been a couple of years now that we 
joined the paid plan and we really uh, lean on it heavily now. So we have shared shared channels with most of our key accounts and um, occasionally, so we don't really use Teams. Uh, occasionally someone's like, sorry, that we're, we're Microsoft Teams and uh, we don't have an answer for that. But uh, if they are using Slack, it's, it's also handy. It's not a good way to record, to have records or have a lot of formal stuff, but it's a great way to um, just work through issues and just kind of post updates and things like that. Yeah, instead of an email chain where someone's inevitably like left off by mistake. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that's overall the key is like email, it's ubiquitous, it, it has its purpose, but if you're trying to actually transact business over email, it's, uh, there's just so many pitfalls and, um, yeah, Slack is a re really useful tool, and we've we've also uh, embraced it with our our test automation stuff. Can push into we have a Slack app for that, so it's a nice way to just kind of get a feed of what's coming down the line. And um, you don't really re rely on it, but it's just a nice, handy way to check on things. Yeah, I think when we were preparing uh, for this for this uh, conversation there was like some debate around like, oh, it's like, is this even that interesting? And I think what's interesting, like in terms of these technologies, they're kind of ubiquitous. We're in Silicon Valley. Like, like it's hard to like throw a stone and not hit someone who's like got a Slack yeah. account. Um, but like, I think what's really interesting about this is that technology doesn't have to be glamorous. It just needs to work. <laughs> um, and I think there's certainly the, um, we, we talk to a lot of contract manufacturers who have a really, difficult time trying to figure out like how to identify the right technology opportunities or how to structure useful pilots or um, how to think about these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, like having a Slack instance feels like, you know, kind of basic, but like, I don't know of any other contract manufacturers transacting with their customers in real time on Slack. Like, I mean, iMessage, yeah, or like That's WeChat. All, but, like, all, all day long, right? But <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we, we, we use WeChat, we're, we chat, of but uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, one of those things where it doesn't feel like you're in a company so much when you're doing that. It's, it's a little, it's a little risky um, to, to rely on that for notifications and things like that. It's more of a fallback um, in our, for us. Um, and Slack is cheap. So, uh, you know, it, it really, that one I probably could make up an ROI on <laughs> just because it's uh, it's so easy. Um, awesome. Maybe um, kind of question, I guess, for other contract manufacturers who are trying to think about how to structure useful pilots or evaluate new technology, like whether they should work on productivity tools, communication tools, um, AI, whiz bang, like, you know, whatever's what, like, there's a deluge of things you probably get pitched by various um, companies. What kind of recommendations do you have for how other leaders can kind of filter through that noise and, and find things that are going to be really valuable for the organization? I would if there's something that you're doing in email or Excel and it feels a little um, unreliable, I would I would try something. I guess in our case, we we tr we we kind of built up a big stack of these things. So Zendesk Zendesk is another one I didn't mention yet, and and Salesforce and our finance, our HR, like all of this was in the cloud, and it was a pretty big spend. And then our process was, well, how do we collapse this or how do we streamline it? Our team had, you know, login fatigue. It was like, you're logging into this and this and this. It was kind of, uh, it was, it was overwhelming. And so then our process was to consolidate as much as we could and reduce, reduce annual spend on it. So that, it's a little painful, but it kind of worked. I mean, that way you can, you, you just have try a lot of them and then see what ones are actually sticking and your team will push back too. So as, if, if they're like, I hate this, I'm not going to use it. And you hear that every day for a couple months, you're going to drop it. <laughs> and so 
um, I guess that'd be that. That's the approach I would take. And then, and the the endless question is always build versus buy. Um, and I know that you know many CMs have a strong DIY attitude. I mean, ultimately, they're teams of people who make things for a living. Like it makes sense that they'd have a DIY attitude. And actually, that's something that um, you all thought about when you're started building the test equipment that you now sell as a product. Um, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you think about build versus buy for stuff that's within the capability of the organization to build, um, but may not be like the primary path that you make money in, you know, at time zero. Um, how, how do you think about that? Uh, we always buy if it's available. <laughs> and so why? Why? Because that's not always everybody's answer. So why is that? I guess I've just spent so much time with our with our CTO Evo and and the dev team, and they just they they've in, infused their frustration of supporting tool. You know, like it's it's never just a build. It's a build and maintain and document and create support around it and, and improve probably. <laughs> and add new features and i mean it's it's it took us a very 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 long time to ever decide to put our brand on a product or service where we're just like all right let's build let's let's build this because it just simply was a whole you know there was nowhere to turn so we built it very very reluctantly so i would so what I, does it do it just, introduce it to folks on the who are listening yeah, so it's for firmware deployment and test automation. So generally on when you're making electronics, you got to program them and then you've got to do um, various voltage electrical tests and uh, make, um, make sure everything's within limits and hopefully you have a report at the end of it on every single unit. So our, our box and our cloud backend automates that and uh, we call it the production line tool or, or PLT. And like I say, we just couldn't find, there were programming solutions, there were test automation solutions, there were, uh, all these things were fairly expensive and we just, it was much easier in this particular case to build it than to buy it. And then now others have adopted that product? Yeah, yeah, so we weren't sure um, it was working for us and we kind of thought, hey, this could be a product and we feel we've been vindicated in that. So uh, it's a product and this year we're launching a Gen 2 of that product. Awesome. Really exciting. Congratulations on, the, on that. Um, and on, I guess, in this case, making the brave decision to build, um, maybe because you couldn't buy, uh, but... Uh, you know, it's great to hear. So maybe as a last question, before we open up the session, um, for those folks out there who work with CMs, um, whether it's Blue Clover or Foxconn, um, what recommendations do you have for them if they want to implement a technology on their manufacturing line for their product? So like a, like essentially a customer driven desire, what's the right way to start that conversation that's like most likely to end positively? getting them to so getting a cm to adopt uh third party technology yeah or, like maybe there's like a specific thing they want to try like the like the cut your customer wants to try something um or maybe they they want to they've like seen something and they want like the cm to like adapt or utilize um and like some of those conversations are very productive and they go really well um, yeah. I imagine approaches that would not be productive and like would not go well. And so like, what kind of advice do you have for how you want to be like part of that conversation as a CM when, when your customer is really excited to, to try something um, out on the line that might be different and new? I think it's one way to make that outcome better is to bring it up early on. So if it's if you're working with a CM and you go through EVT and then DVT and you're, you know, hoping, hoping for a successful PVT and then you technology, you're probably going to get a lot of pushback and they're good. And they're in a fairly secure position because you're not going to move at that moment. But if it's early in the relationship, 
that's a great time to bring it up. And um, it does seem, I've presented our tool to CMs and often they are highly resistant. They're like, oh, we make that, we have a PLT too, or we build that every day. It's not really that, that new. Um, so if you're the customer, you have, you have the power, customer is always right. So you can insist, um, you can deliver that. I think um, events like this are great because it gets people thinking about uh, what technology they want to see on the line rather than just uh, thinking of it once the line is all set up because it is largely too late at, at that time. And um, uh, so being prepared to deliver it and say, well, here is how we want it tested and just not letting that become part of the quote and, and, and just say, because a lot of CMs will um, make the NRE just very cryptic. And, and then once we've seen scenarios where the project has already started and then they've kind of waved their hands about what the NRE is and they'll just say, well, that's, that's included. But then when you want to move it and you want to take these things with you, they're like, oh, well, now it's not included anymore. This was actually part of our own factory and you can't take this. We'll send the racks, but not the equipment. Um, so having that conversation about the technology you want to use early, I guess, would be the main advice. That's awesome. Thanks for being very tactical with that. Um, so we're going to we're going to open up the session. If you have questions, like raise your hand. But thanks for joining us this week on Change Notice. You can find us at instrumental.com slash change dash notice. Um, join us next week for a session on uh, remote work and hiring specifically in hardware companies uh, when you're trying to build stuff and ramp products. Um, and if you have an idea for an upcoming change notice, let me know. Reach out. Um, awesome.